Why does the temptation to sin seem to create in most of us this irresistible urge? You ever thought about that? It's like, in many cases, we're powerless to resist it. Now, if, if you're not tempted by something, you know, like, uh, I don't covet cars. So if you brought in a Lamborghini and put it here in front of me, I'd go, oh, that's nice, you know, that's, that's fine. But I'm not going to covet that. There are other things I do. So, uh, but when we are tempted in a sin, it becomes almost this irresistible urge to give in to it. Uh, I heard this story this week from CBS News. It was in February of this year. Police in Pennsylvania cited an obvious telltale clue in the arrest of a man for the theft of spaghetti sauce and meatballs. This would tempt me. How did they discover that he was the perpetrator of the crime? Well, it wasn't that difficult, really. They just picked the guy that had red sauce all over his face and clothes. Law enforcement officers in Luzerne County arrested Lehman Glenn Robert Potter with burglary, criminal trespass, and theft after he was alleged to have stolen a pot of meatballs simmering in spaghetti sauce from his neighbor's garage. Authorities said the neighbor reported the meatballs missing after he noticed Potter standing in front of his house with sauce all over his face. <laughs> the neighbor immediately called the police who once they arrived, recovered the missing pot near where the fellow was standing in the middle of the street. And though officials would not discuss any further details, unofficial sources claimed that they got to the real motive behind the, the heinous act. And that was that the meatballs and sauce just looked and smelled too good to pass up. Potter was arrested and held in lieu of a $25,000 bond. You heard it? A $25,000 bond for stealing spaghetti and meatballs. Some people just really love their spaghetti and meatballs. And evidently in Luzerne County, Pennsylvania, there's a whole bunch of them living there. But that's what temptation does to us, doesn't it? It's the power of temptation, that it, it makes us do things that we know we shouldn't do because it, it just seems to create in us an irresistible urge. Well, last week we started a new eight-week preaching series that I'm calling The War Within, and uh, we're studying Romans chapters 7 and 8 and trying to understand more about the internal conflict that we as Christians experience between life in the flesh under the law and life in Christ by the Holy Spirit. And there is conflict between the two. If you happen to miss the message that we had last week, as I said earlier, you can listen to it at our website at riverridgewi.com. Now, last week, Paul used an illustration of marriage to help us understand. And the idea was is that before we met Christ, we were kind of married to the law. Uh, let's call it Mr. Law. And then when we met Jesus, we were married to Christ. We'll call him Mr. Grace. Now, the law was not a, a bad man. In fact, he was a very good man. We really couldn't point out a single fault of Mr. Law's with the exception of only one thing, and that is, is that we just couldn't ever seem to completely satisfy him. No matter how hard we tried to do everything the way that he wanted, we routinely failed and we missed out on his love and acceptance as a result. Then one day, Mr. Law died. And it wasn't long after that that we met and married Christ. We call him Mr. Grace. He loved and accepted us despite our failures and not because of anything that we've done for him. Jesus had to do something for us. He had to go to the cross of Calvary and die on the cross to remove the sin barrier so that we could have a relationship with him and to break the power of sin over us. And so we received his love and forgiveness by faith. And because he didn't demand that we would earn it, he doesn't make any demands that we would keep it either. He simply chooses to love and accept us. And when we come to understand how much Jesus loves and accepts us, and that nothing can separate us from that love, something happens inside of every one of us. We begin to take pleasure in pleasing our Lord and doing the things that he would like for us to do, much like a, a bride who truly loves her husband enjoys honoring and pleasing him. That's why we're called the bride of Christ. And that is the difference between being married to the law or married to Christ. Now today we're going to look at verses 7 through 13 of Romans chapter 7, where Paul asks and he answers two questions to help us understand the purpose of the law. 
if indeed it hasn't been given so that we can earn eternal life, then why do we have it? And so he starts with the first question. If you have your Bibles, in Romans 7, verse 7, he says, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? Now Paul's anticipating an argument that if the law leads us to death, then maybe it's not so good for us. Maybe, in fact, we shouldn't have the law. And so in the next five verses here in Romans chapter 7, he, he helps us to understand the various ways that the law impacts us as Christians. And he, and he gives us the first one in, in verse 7. He asks the question, is the law sin? And then he answers it, by no means. Yet if it had not been for the law, he says, I would have not have known sin. I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. So God gives us the law to help us know the difference between right and wrong. Uh, it seems reasonable, at least to me, to define sin as doing something that God doesn't want you to do. That would be a sin of commission. Or not doing something that God does want you to do. That would be a sin of omission. And for Paul, who was at one time a religious leader of the Jews, he probably thought he was a pretty righteous man. I suspect that he could have said that with a great deal of confidence that he kept God's laws faithfully. And it wasn't until he was approached by Christ on the road to Damascus one day, you can read about it in the book of Acts, and he had an encounter with the Lord Jesus that his opinion of himself began to change. That's when he first came under conviction of his own sin. And here he identifies the sin that nailed him, the sin that really got him, was the sin of coveting. It was a, a clear violation of the 10th commandment. You know that one. It's, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. The word covet means to have a strong desire for something that rightfully belongs to someone else. And up to this point in his life, Paul was convinced that his conduct was proper, that he kept the commandments, that he did everything right before the Lord, at least as far as people could see. But in a brief encounter with the Lord, he began to realize that there were certain sins that people couldn't see that were taking place in here, and one of those was the sin of coveting. Jesus takes that sin and talks about it in the context of coveting another man's wife. He says, anyone who looks at a woman lustfully, that's the idea of coveting her with unholy desire, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And it was through the sin of coveting that Paul began to know that he wasn't the man he thought he, he thought he was, that he had some issues taking place in his life. For the first time, he understood that it was possible to look good on the outside, but to harbor sinful desires in our hearts. And so he discovers, thanks to the law, the Tenth Commandment in particular, that he's not the man he thought he was. But that's what the law is supposed to do. He said, I, I wouldn't have even known sin had it not been for the law. It revealed my sin in me. That's what sin does. Read the law, you'll discover your sin. And then he says something else. The law provokes sin, verse 8. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. Apart from the law, sin lies dead. Now that phrase, seizing an opportunity, is, is important to understand if we're going to understand the verse. It was actually a military term, and it stood for a base of operation, a starting point for some sort of military campaign. In this case, Paul is saying that it is sin that establishes a base or a foothold in our lives through the commandments. Let me explain. Have you ever noticed that when someone tells you not to do something, you suddenly find that you want to do it? Did you ever notice that? I mean, if you see a sign that says, wet paint, do not touch, what do you want to do? You want to touch it, don't you? Just to see if it's really wet. Don't do it. But that's how we feel, right? Uh, or what about this? If you have two boys and uh, an older boy who's, say, seven, and he's kind of smacking around his little brother who's five, and you say, you stop that, and you leave the room, what's he going to do? Sit down and play checkers? No. He's going to rail on his little brother until you catch him again. That's just what happens. Or, or maybe you are driving and the speed limit says 55 miles per hour. But do you do 55? No. You do 57, 58, 60, 
65. There's just something inside of us that, that makes us want to, to violate the law. Uh, they call it negative psychology. Uh, it, it's what appeals to our fallen human natures. If you tell us not to do something, we'll immediately start trying to figure out a way to get away with it. And by the way here, the law, the Bible says, is not the culprit. It's not the law that is motivating you to sin. That comes from within you. The law is just pointing out that it is sin. That it's something that you are doing that is wrong and making you aware of it and making you aware that when you do it, you are clearly disobeying God. Our, our country has a great example of this. Ratified on January 29, 1919 by the U.S. Congress, the 18th Amendment banned the manufacture, transportation, and sale of intoxicating liquors. It was known as the Volstead Act. And right away, both federal and local governments struggled to enforce prohibition over the course of the 1920s. Despite very early signs of success, including a decline in arrest for drunkenness and a reported 30% drop in alcohol consumption, those who wanted to keep drinking found ever more inventive ways to do it. The illegal manufacturing and sale of liquor, known as bootlegging, went on throughout the decade, along with the operation of speakeasies, uh, those are nightclubs selling alcohol, the smuggling of alcohol across state lines, and the informal production of liquor. That's right, moonshine or bathtub gin in private homes. In addition, the Prohibition era encouraged the rise of criminal activity, associated with bootlegging. The most, most notorious of those criminals was a man named Al Capone. He earned at that time, now get this, in the 1920s from his bootlegging, $60 million annually. Such illegal operations fueled a corresponding rise in gang violence, including the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in Chicago in 1929, in which several men dressed as policemen and believed to be associated with Capone killed a group of men in an enemy gang. The high price of bootleg liquor meant that the nation's working class and poor were far more restricted during prohibition than the middle and upper classes. Even as costs for law enforcement, jails, and prisons spiraled upward, support for prohibition was waning by the end of the 20s. And in 1933, President Roosevelt got Congress to enact the 21st Amendment, repealing the 18th. Why? Because if you tell people not to do something, they just want to do it, and they will do it. They'll always find a way around the law. Make a law that says you can't sin, and we'll try to figure out how to sin. There's a third thing that Paul wants us to understand about the law. It condemns sin. Verse 9, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity, that's that same phrase, a base of operation, through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. This is Paul's way of saying that the law didn't bring us life, it actually condemned us to death. And when he and really all human beings since the time of Adam and Eve gave in to the deceitfulness of sin, sin holds out a lie, it says to every one of us, this is where life is really found. If you do this in disobedience, you'll be happy. That's what that means. But through it all, death came. And in the Bible, death means separation. When we die physically, our soul is separated from its body. When we die spiritually, uh, our spirit is, is spiritually dead and we are separated from God. And both are the result of this principle of sin seizing its opportunity through the law and bringing us under God's righteous judgment. Listen to what the Bible says about God's judgment. Romans 5, 16. The judgment followed one sin, and it brought condemnation to everybody. The law brings condemnation. It heaps guilt upon every one of us because we know that we have lived in disobedience to God, and that deep inside, we deserve His righteous judgment. It may not seem like a benefit of the law at all, but if we didn't have that kind of spiritual condemnation, that kind of conviction in our lives, how would we know to turn to a Savior? How would we know we needed one? So Paul asked that question. What then shall we say? 
that the law is sin, and then he answers it. He answers it in verse 12. He's concluded that the law reveals sin, it provokes sin, and it condemns sin. And so he says, so the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and righteous, and good. So the law isn't evil. In fact, it's, it's good in its intention. We just can't live up to its standard. And so Paul asks the second question here in this passage, in verse 13. Did that which is good then bring death to me? If the law is good, did it really bring death? Now, why did he ask that? Because he didn't want believers to blame God's holy law for their own sinfulness or to suggest that if, if they didn't have his law, perhaps they were better off without it. And so then he says this in verse 13, in answer to that second question. Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means. It was sin, producing death in me through what is good, in order that sin might be shown to be sin, and through the commandment might become sinful beyond measure. You see, the law was, wasn't given to kill us, it was given to convict us. It doesn't cause us to sin. It exposes and condemns sin. Because we have God's law, we can see maybe even just a glimpse of how sinful we actually are. And that leads me to one more question in this brief message this morning. Not found in your text, but it's one we ought to ask. Do people here in America still know God's law? Do people in America... Let's reduce it to the Ten Commandments. Do they know the Ten Commandments? You know, they were given to Moses by God on Mount Sinai about 3,300 years ago. For centuries, they have really stood as the foundation for Jewish and Christian morality. Uh, if you look at census studies on people's uh, belief in the law, 78% still believe they are important enough to be publicly displayed across the country. Yet, ironically, more people can name the Three Stooges. Do you know the Three Stooges? Mo, Larry, and Curly, or Shemp. More people can name all six kids from the Brady Bunch. Can you do it? Greg, Marsha, Peter, Jan, Bobby, and Cindy. And even the seven ingredients of a Big Mac to all beef patties. Special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. Then they can name the Ten Commandments. They value it. At least they say they do. They just can't name them. In case you don't remember, the first one says you can have no other gods but the God of the universe, the God of Israel. Uh, you can't make for yourself a graven image, another idol to worship in place of God. You can't take the name of the Lord God in vain. That means to render it meaningless. Uh, you must remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. This was particularly for the Jews to make sure that they set aside a day for rest and for worship. You shall honor your father and mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. And the tenth one, we've already talked about it, you shall not cover your neighbor's house or for that matter, anything in your neighbor's house. Sadly, while the majority of Americans say that these commandments really matter, they don't know them, and they're disappearing from the hearts and minds of most of us. So I want to give you three reasons why I think that we have allowed the Ten Commandments, God's law, to become uh, just a, a forgotten memory. The first is, we don't teach the law because it makes us feel guilty. You don't feel guilty if you have no standard to live by, but the moment you know what the law says, you know that you're in violation of it. That's why the condemnation comes. That's what Paul was talking about. And so we don't teach the law, we don't talk about it in our families because it makes us feel guilty when we know we violate it. Secondly, we don't teach the law because it exposes our pride. Sin is an arrogant attempt to make life work apart from God. Sin is saying to God, I know more about life than you do, and I'm going to do it my own way. Thank you very much. And then you choose to live the way you want. 
And when we read the law, we realize that it exposes the arrogance and pride that's in every one of us. And thirdly, we don't teach the law because it reveals our weakness. Human beings share at least one thing in common. We are morally weak. We don't keep the law. We can't earn our way to heaven. That's why we need a Savior. We just don't have the ability to keep God's law. By the way, I want to ask you today, have you come to that understanding that you need a Savior, that Jesus is willing to be that Savior for you, that he wanted to accomplish his Father's will, even if it meant separation on the cross of Calvary, that he would die there in your place for your sin? He's the one who takes us in our moral weakness and makes us new creations and gives us new life. You would do well to read the Ten Commandments to your family and to help them understand that they don't save us, but they do teach us right and wrong. Author and Pastor John MacArthur tells this story. He said, I was flying down to El Paso to do a men's conference. I was working on some thoughts and had my Bible open. I was sitting next to an Arab. He kept glancing over and looking at me and what I was doing. And finally he said, may I ask you a question? I am from Iran and I am new in America. I see you have a Bible. I don't understand American religion. What is the difference between being a Catholic, a Protestant, and a Baptist? And so John MacArthur gave him a little explanation. Then the man said, uh, then MacArthur said, could I ask you a question? Do Muslims have sins? He said, I knew the answer, but I wanted to hear what the guy would say. And the guy said, oh, we have so many sins. I don't even know all the sins. Really? Can I ask you another question? Do you do those sins? All the time I do those sins. In fact, I'll be honest with you. I'm going to El Paso right now to do some sins. Do you mind if I ask you what you're planning on doing in El Paso? Well, I was immigrating, and El Paso was a good place to immigrate, and I met this girl, and I'm going to El Paso to do some sins with her. How does God, MacArthur asked, as you understand God, feel about your sins? He said, oh, it's very bad. It's, it's very bad. How bad is it? I could go to hell. Well, you don't want to go there, do you? No. Then why do you keep doing these sins? I can't help it. Well, is there any hope for you? I hope God will forgive me. And then MacArthur said, why are you so special that he should do that? Why should God forgive you? I don't know, I just hope. And MacArthur surprised him. Maybe his answer will surprise you too. He said, well, I know him personally, and he won't. And that blew the man's mind. He said, wait, you know God personally? What do you mean that you know God personally? He said, I do know him personally. And I can tell you that he will not forgive your sin. He can't look on sin. He's angry with the wicked every day and is going to cast the wicked into eternal hell. But if you would like to hear the good news, God has some when it comes to your sin. And he said, yes, I would. And he told him about Jesus, the Lord, who paid the penalty for that sin who took his father's wrath on the cross so that sinners could become holy ones before God, our sins forgiven. I want to ask you today, I want to give you the opportunity. If you want Jesus to be your savior, if you come under conviction from God's word, if you know you've broken the law multiple times, but let me encourage you, don't leave here without making sure that you've received the forgiveness of sin that's offered in the person of, of Jesus Christ. That he became the Lamb of God, as the John the Baptist said, who would take away the sin of the world through faith in his death on the cross that our sins can be paid for. It's as simple as saying, Lord Jesus, I admit I'm a sinner. I admit that I cannot save myself. I will die and go to hell without my, with that sin in my life. Right now, I choose to turn to Jesus to ask him to be my savior, to pay the penalty for my sin in my place and make me into a brand new person, to forgive all my sins and to help me be a follower of his. If you prayed that prayer today, tell somebody. It just does you good to tell somebody.
that today you invited Jesus to be your Savior. Now, I know the services went a little long today, so we're not going to do the last song. I'm going to ask you to stand, and I'm going to give you the benediction and the dismissal, okay? Father, we thank you for this time and your word. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you. We want to be uh, Christ followers who walk in his footsteps, who live in obedience and under the same control of the Holy Spirit that he exercised control in as he walked the earth. So please help us to walk with you today. We ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today and remain with you always. Amen. God bless you. Go in peace and serve the Lord.